BC as an asset class is bullshit, in my opinion. But again, there's are there are outliers, but you as the average investor will never be able to invest in those funds. He was able to play the game in sort of the social proof. He played that very, very well and was very successful. Photo ops with Tom Brady and Giselle and Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and you know all these people were like, yeah, Sam, 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 Sam. He had that all locked up, but he's a complete crook and idiot on the other side. So it's it's a sad thing. He could have done some great things with all of the access that he was given if he had not decided to just steal all the money. He makes so much money doing nothing. So why would you take risk free trading? You just wait for the inflows. Okay, great. You want to send me your Bitcoin? I'll charge you 2% management fee. Thank you very much. That's all I have to do. You don't go just out like and a bank trade that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's just the dumbest thing ever. Here is my prediction on what's going to happen with FTX. So John Ray, who is the CEO in the bankruptcy proceedings, is going to try to get back as much money as possible and liquidate as many things as he can. And they'll get to a number. I don't know what that number is going to be, but it's going to be less than the eight or 10 or 15 billion, whatever it is that customers and other uh, lenders are owed. Et nous l'équipe, j'espère que vous allez bien. Avant de commencer l'interview, je voulais mentionner plusieurs choses. Première chose, regardez l'interview en entière. Arthur Ray, c'est une des personnes que j'admire le plus dans l'écosystème. C'est véritablement un pionnier. Il a créé BitMEX, il a créé les Perpetual Swaps, qui sont aujourd'hui des produits dérivés que vous traitez tous sur Binance, Bybit, BitGet, peu importe les plateformes. C'est euh, eh bien le produit le plus tradé en crypto. Donc voilà pour vous dire à quel point euh, cet homme est une pointure. Euh, c'est surtout quelqu'un que j'admire profondément, qui m'intéresse profondément, que je suis depuis très très longtemps. Et de ce fait-là, j'étais un peu stressé. Donc voilà, l'anglais n'était pas tip top. Euh, il n'était pas aussi bon qu'avec euh, Certic, mais voilà, j'espère que vous ne m'en tiendrez pas rigueur. Et avant de commencer, n'hésitez pas surtout à activer les sous-titres parce que cette vidéo est en anglais. Et donc, euh, eh bien, vous avez les sous-titres français disponibles euh, directement sur le lecteur YouTube. Donc voilà, n'hésitez pas à activer tout ça. Et donc, vous pourrez suivre de la meilleure des manières cette interview. Allez, on est parti. Hello à tous l'équipe, j'espère que vous allez bien. Aujourd'hui, on se retrouve pour une nouvelle interview. Cette fois, j'ai le plaisir de recevoir Arthur Hayes, qui est absolument une légende en crypto, qui a notamment créé euh, BitMEX, euh, qui a démocratisé les perpetual swaps et qui est d'ailleurs euh, un entrepreneur euh, qui a eu beaucoup de réussite et euh, qui est très, très connu de l'industrie. Donc, très content de le recevoir. Hello Arthur, thank you very much for accepting this interview. Oh. Uh, Thanks for I'm very glad to, to having uh, you on this show. Um, to be honest, I've been following you since the very early days. Uh, I've been a very active trader, especially on BitMEX. So having you uh, on this show is like kind of crazy, to be honest. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, how are you doing? Excellent. I'm doing really, really well. It's uh, sitting here in the jungle. It's nice and hot. So I'm always in my tank top because it's really, really hot. But otherwise, feeling good. I'm really happy that the bull market is... I think starting and getting that tingly feeling, it's fun opening up my trading apps and starting to trade some shit coins. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> Are you still personally trading or more focused on, uh, I would say, VC and in other type of things? Or are you personally trading yourself? So I usually don't trade too much unless there's actually like stuff to do, but there's a lot of fun things that are happening in the ecosystem right now. And so I love trading. So yeah, I do trade. Not that actually as I used to before, but, you know, I place trades here and there, trade a lot of shit coins, OTC, um, do some derivative trades and yeah, mostly manage sort of from a high level, the VC early stage token deals that um, Maelstrom is doing. Um, I'm very glad to have you because I think this is the first time you've been um, uh, hosted like uh, on a French uh, speaking show. Uh, I think this is the first, yes, part, is. The first time you're speaking to the French speaking community. So this is kind of crazy. Uh, I think m most of people here uh, know you, but definitely some people that uh, may be less active, I would say, in the ecosystem might not know you. Uh, maybe can you introduce yourself to the French speaking community? Sure. So obviously, name is Arthur Hayes, uh, co-founder of Bitmex, the Bitcoin Mercantile Exchange. So before I got into crypto, I think it's been almost 10 years now since I've been in the game. I used to work at a investment bank, so Deutsche Bank and then Citibank. And I was the lead uh, exchange traded fund or ETF market maker for both banks out in Asia Pacific. So I quoted prices on the Hong Kong and Singapore stock exchanges. I made risk prices in global ETFs during Asian time hours. So I did that for five years. The best thing that ever happened to me was I got fired from my job at Citibank in 2013. <laughs> and then I read the Satoshi white paper and it was all over from there. 
I started trading derivatives on some of the early exchanges back in 2013, and then came up with this idea that I wanted to build uh, BitMEX. And you know, we launched in 2014. And I guess our claim to fame is a creation of the perpetual swap, which is basically the most traded crypto instrument globally. Every single exchange and DeFi platform has a version of this product that we created back in 2016. This is kind of crazy because uh, at the end of the day, you are kind of the father of perpetual swaps on, on crypto, right? Which is like the, the kind of product the mostly trading, mostly used in, in crypto, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So whether it's you know a centralized exchange like BitMEX and some others or your GMX, DY, DX or some of these um, exchanges that are on the DeFi protocols, everybody has a perpetual swap or has tried to innovate on the perpetual swap. You mentioned that you've been in the game for 10 years. Um, this is a very long time, I think, in this uh, industry. Uh, what keeps you in the industry? Why are you still working or are, are you invested in this industry uh, until today and maybe for like the next 10 years? So I think it's so much fun. And the types of people that are in crypto are the most interesting people that I've ever met. And it's a combination of politics, economics, markets, everything all together, technology, and it's a social experiment where people from the grassroots level are coming together, different languages, different countries, different cultures, with this goal of separating money and the state and creating a alternate financial system that we hope is an improvement on the, the one that's been in, in existence for the past few hundred years. And so we're at this moment in time where it's you know cryptography, it's computers, it's networking, it's artificial intelligence, all these things coming together. And now we have blockchain as well and cryptocurrencies. And it's just this pivotal moment in sort of development of the, the human experience. And it's just so exciting. I don't know what I would do with, with else my time besides doing crypto. And maybe AI? You know, every, sorry? Maybe AI or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but I think crypto has an AI component. I think that AIs or artificial intelligent units are going to use cryptocurrencies for payments, for storage, uh, for governance, all these different things. So the movement of cryptocurrencies and this innovation called blockchain is going to touch every facet of technology. And you know, we might look back in a few decades and wonder why the system was ever like it was. How do we invent the computer and the internet and still allow ourselves to be beholden to these analog financial institutions that are ripping us off because they use antiquated ways of doing things when we have this amazing thing called the internet and computers and cryptography and the blockchain and all these different things. So I think there's just so much change that's going to happen and I like being in the middle of it. <laughs> um, uh just before I mentioned that most of the time was spent like on BitMEX, I, I would say in the last 10 years, uh, I think this is quite fair to say. Um, how did your experience uh, at BitMEX kind of change your perspectives on, on crypto? Um, did, did it change a lot of things for you on, on your crypto perspectives? Because now you have like a lot of thesis on, on the crypto industry, on the crypto ecosystem and like on economic um, but how did like BitMEX maybe help you to uh, evolve and change your views on the crypto industry as a whole? So thankfully, I was able to get in on the ground level on probably the best business model within crypto, and that is <laughs> exchanges, right? So we actually make money. The exchanges and miners are really the only two things in crypto uh, that really make any sort of real money. And so Thankfully, I was able to participate in the founding of one of the early exchanges and done very well financially for myself. And because I believe in the technology and the change that we're trying to sponsor, I now have the ability to go deeper on some of the other technical aspects of crypto that might not today be the most profitable. But if we think about a financial industry 10, 20, 30, 50 years, 100 years from now, that's predicated on the blockchain, investments made today are going to yield results for a very, very long time. And so I'm, thankfully, I'm able to do that, in addition to obviously owning an exchange. When you think about like your um, BitMEX journey, um, do you have any specific memories in mind or, or like specific days that comes to your mind? Something that kind of like shocked you or uh, that you, you, you think about quite often? So I think when we created the perpetual swap, that was 
probably the best thing that we ever done, obviously. And it was quite a tumultuous time within the company because at the time, everybody treated futures contracts. That was the way people treated crypto. And we had this idea that we could create a product that our clients would understand better and thus would lead to more trading volumes and to be selfish here, less support tickets because people would understand this product better than a futures contract. So we were, we were able to do this perpetual swap thing, and it wasn't popular at the beginning. A lot of our clients absolutely hated this product, but we were able to persevere, and we had conviction in what we were building, and we did it. So I think that was a very interesting time. A lot of people were you know, throwing a shade on the socials for launching this thing called a swap that they didn't understand, but it just took you know, a belief in what we were doing and the goal, and we got there. Are you a, a Bitcoin maximalist in a way? Because like um, uh, in the very early days of BitMEX, uh, when you wanted to trade on BitMEX, you were forced in a way to, 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 to have like Bitcoin as collateral. Um, is it like something uh, ethic or is something that is like because you added it because you were like a, a Bitcoin maximalist or like was it just convenient at this time to have, to have uh, Bitcoin as a collateral on the platform. Cette vidéo vous est présentée en partenariat avec DYDX. DYDX est LA solution décentralisée qui vous permet de trader les principales crypto-monnaies de manière liquide sur mobile et ordinateur. Contrairement à la majorité des exchanges, vous n'avez pas besoin de vous kawaii ici et vous récupérez la majorité des frais que vous payez. Plus de 60 000 personnes utilisent déjà DYDX et j'en fais partie, alors qu'attendez-vous Scannez le QR code sur votre écran ou utilisez le lien dans la description pour créer votre compte avec un simple wallet et profitez de 5% de réduction sur vos frais. Allez, on repart sur l'interview. So obviously, when we started out, Bitcoin was the only thing. There wasn't even Ethereum at the time. And so, yes, we were definitely Bitcoin maximalists, if you want to call it that, in terms of the most efficient <laughs> way to move collateral in and out of the platform. But we obviously probably made a, a business error by not adding more coins faster onto the platform as things evolved in like 2019 and, and 2020 as sort of the, a plethora of coins were much safer to use as an exchange. And there was a lot of demand from clients to to trade them. So by no means am I a Bitcoin maximalist. The decision and the you know reason why BitMEX was a Bitcoin only place for a long period of times was mainly due to the you know difficulties in custodying other assets and our reticence to introduce more risk into a business that model that was at the time working. I think it's been like what like three years, four years that you retired in a way from from BitMEX. Um, did you uh, learn any lessons from creating and running such a large um, company and such a large exchange in the industry? Yeah, I learned something about myself. I absolutely hate management. I never, ever again <laughs> want to run a company. I don't like working with a few hundred people. Uh, when I, you know, as the organization grew, all my day was um, human resources, managing egos of my senior managers. It really sucked. I hated it. I wasn't good at it. I'll never do that again. And I like the ability now at Maelstrom, I think we have two other employees at the firm. And so it's really nice to work with a very small group of people. Um, we just want to you know, make money. There's no politics. Uh, I don't have to manage other people's egos. And we no just bullshit. do what we came to work to do. Exactly. No bullshit. <laughs> and so um, maybe can you introduce Maelstrom to the people watching us? Um, it, it, Like what makes maybe Maelstrom different from like the other funds like in town? Yeah. So the, the biggest difference is we don't have outside investors. So it's just my money, which basically means we do what the <laughs> fuck I want to do. And I don't have to listen to a bunch of Muppets who might have a lot of money, but have no fucking clue about crypto. And so that allows us a lot of freedom in the types of deals that we do. We don't do large check sizes. Uh, because, again, we're not trying to compete with larger funds who have to deploy lots of capital. We are very patient because we don't have to deploy capital to get paid like a traditional venture capital fund. Uh, nobody at Railstrom, including myself, makes any money unless we do deals that are good deals and we sell them for more than we paid for them. So it's a very markets focused uh, fund. And I think that allows us to be very practical with you know, how we speak to founders, the type of advice that we give. We're, we're not trying to, you know, screw anyone. We don't own a large percentage of any of these projects. We're trying to be as helpful as we can. And in some cases, we're able to amplify the success of our projects, given the wide reach that my voice and my writing has. 
But like, are, are you kind of like a, a crypto VC in a way, or are you also invested in the other markets uh, available to you? Uh, like, is it 100% focused on crypto and mostly like on on, on pre-seed, seed and Serie A investments? Or are you also, I don't know, buying treasure bills, like uh, this kind of shit with, uh, with the fund? So the fund Maelstrom is just doing crypto. So we primarily do early stage token deals. We love tokens. I fucking hate equity. I don't know how I'm going to get paid. <laughs> I don't want to wait seven years to get my money back. I want my money back immediately. So I love tokens. So that's where we focus all a lot of our efforts outside of Maelstrom. You know, my entire like global portfolio. Yeah. I have treasury bills. I've got some, you know, some stonks, some, you know, dog shit trap by things. And I sort of try to manage that blend of, okay, well, if crypto is not doing well because, you know, interest rates are rising, you know, I want to participate in that, in that rate move. But as it seems like the global central banks are going to start printing money again in a, you know, crazy amount, then I want to give back in, in the crypto bucket. So it's kind of just moving assets between each of the two buckets with the express goal being that I want to maintain a standard purchasing power, a standard lifestyle in terms of energy. So I consume a lot of energy living the life that I leave. I like it. I want to keep doing it. And if the price of oil is you know, $1,000 10 years from now, I want my portfolio to have appreciated enough so that I can afford to live the way I like to live, even if energy gets much more expensive. You mentioned that you hate uh, having your, your money kind of locked in a way for like, I don't know, seven years, like uh, while investing in um, uh, pre-seed, seed and Serie A kind of uh, rounds for, for companies. Um, do you think that we'll see more and more tokenized stocks so that we could exchange like uh, e easily like um, this kind of like um, companies that are not like um, available to everyone, uh, I don't know, listed on the NASDAQ or whatever, or is it something that will never change anywhere? Well, I mean, I'm not really bullish on tokenized stocks because I believe that there's so much liquidity in the traditional way of doing it. Why, unless you have some massive new distribution channel, why go through all the effort of tokenizing it and making it a little bit more cumbersome? My vision is that the new organizations of the future are not going to be like joint stock companies that we've essentially been building since the 17th century. We're going to change the way that we organize economic activity. I think a lot of that's going to be spurred on by the advent of artificial intelligence and how these computers and humans work together to do economic things. They're not going to launch companies. I think they're going to launch the you know, decentralized autonomous organization or DAOs. I think they're going to exist primarily on a blockchain native substrate like uh, an Ethereum. So the most exciting um, entrepreneurial activities of the future are going to be token first things. They're, ne they're never even going to think about what's equity. I don't even know what that is. I know that a DAO can issue tokens and I know about treasury management. I know that governance tokens and all these different things that we're familiar with and that are being new in the token ecosystem. But why would I ever incorporate a company? Why would an, a, a computer incorporate a company and deal with lawyers and courts and paperwork and all these different things? Like, why the fuck am I still signing pieces of paper with a pen? I fucking hate that shit. Like, <laughs> it makes no fucking sense. Yeah, I, I think the, the world is kind of like moving uh, very slowly on sp some specific areas, which is kind of like uh, weird because we have like some great innovations like AI, GPT, these kind of things. So... Uh, this is quite surprising that, yeah, some of our areas are, are kind of slow compared to other ones. Um, we were mentioning Maelstrom and, and, and like VCs. Um, are VCs that good? Are, are they fully profiting from the advantage on uh, over the retail traders, the retail investors? Um, we've seen some companies like Free Hour Capital um, or even like um, FTX Ventures, Alameda Research get wrecked during this cycle which is kind of crazy to me because they had like kind of gold mode, like seeing like uh, everyone's order, everyone's investments, being able to invest like before anyone. Uh, and still they, they managed to get tracked. So what, what are your views, your critical views on, on VCs and how they are profiting, profiting from uh, their advantage or not uh, over the retail investors and traders? So I think venture capital funds, and you can look at the statistics in general, are bad things, bad investments. And <laughs> It doesn't mean that you're going to lose your money. It's just that your opportunity cost of putting your money in a VC fund versus buying the S&P 500 or some you know, similar sort of broad-based equity index. Like you're paying these guys, mostly guys, a lot of money to do fuck all. And you could have just put your money in an index fund and paid a lot less in fees and got way better performance. You know, 
from 2010 to 2020, the name of the game was let's raise a bunch of money, give it to some consumer or SaaS application. And what do they do? They go out and they buy Facebook and Google ads. So why am I owning your dumbass charging me two and 20 where I could just go buy Facebook and Google and make better returns? So I think venture capital is an asset class, unless you're like the top, top, top firms, you know, the Kleiner Perkins, the A16Zs, the um, Index Ventures, all those guys. Yeah, they make money. But the, the chance of you as some random Muppet getting your money into those funds is impossible. So you're just left with all these dog shit managers who like try to do the same things as the other funds, but just not as good because their deal flow sucks and you end up underperforming the market. So VC as an asset class is bullshit in my opinion. Um, but again, there's are, there are outliers, but you as the average investor will never be able to invest in those funds. So, um, I guess you will be on the top, top, top because you will not create like a VC <laughs> if you don't believe in exactly. it. Exactly. I mean, and if I'm not on the top, 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 who cares? It's just my money. I'm not trying to earn fees from other people and it allows me to be very free with, you know, how I think and how I invest. And if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. And there's there's no one to blame but, you know, myself and the other males from employees. How, how can you be on the top, top, top uh, as a VC in your opinion? Well, again, it comes down to incentives, right? If you are, the name of the game in VC is not making money for your investors. The name of the game in VC is asset aggregation. So people need to understand that the business is not to make money. The business is to aggregate money and charge you management fees. I make way more money making 2% on 10 billion than knocking out of the park with like a $50 million fund uh, in terms of uh, you know, upside performance. So when you understand that it's all about aggregating assets, then it makes sense why VCs are very risk averse. So they want to invest in a deal that everybody else has invested in because if they lose money, they lost money together. So which means <laughs> that as, as a firm, you're not going to take the sort of risk that generate the super high returning things. Because those are the thing, those are the things that people don't actually appreciate today, but come to appreciate in the future. And it's very few people are able to exist in a institutionalized framework of an asset manager and make those decisions and still have a job 20, 30 years down the line. Because invariably, to hit those type of returns, you're going to have to invest in things that everybody said was dog shit and fails. And when you do that, you lose your job. And so the name of the game in you know, fiduciary invest, investment management is do not lose your job. Because you make so much money doing fuck all, why would you want to risk it? So it's that, pers that persuasive like, group think because it's, it makes sense for the manager to think that way. And so that's how you stay on top is not having those incentive that are similar to a large asset manager. So if you're just managing your own money, your incentive is, okay, I need to make enough money for my family to provide for myself, uh, to have the standard of living that I want to have. I'm not trying to basically scam my investors by putting up some pretty pitch decks, but just like, hey, give me your money. I'll charge you 2%. Maybe I'll make you some money 10 years down the line. But you know what? I got my management fees every year and I can get my bonus, right? That's the game of fiduciary and institutional money management. We've not been talking about like the, the, the crypto industry like in, in depth right now. Uh, I wanted to maybe to get back to, to what happened like in this cycle, uh, which, which is kind of crazy because like in the last cycle, we had also crazy things uh, on crypto Twitter or uh, in the ecosystem as well. But still like the, the, this cycle is kind of crazy. Uh, we, we have seen like FTX go bankrupt. Um, I wanted to have your like kind of views on, on, on all the whole situation with FTX and everything, especially like how bearish were you on, on FTX and the SBF like before the bankruptcy? Is it something that you were like telling yourself, okay, those guys will go bankrupt sooner or later? Or this is not something you were really thinking about before it happened? No, I mean, I... I didn't really have any real business dealings with FTX or Sam, so I didn't really have an opinion either one way or the other. I, you know, noted to myself that I, I saw the game that Sam was playing with the, you know, I'm super altruistic. I'm going to give all my money away to charity. I sleep in this piece of shit car and, you know, I sleep on a beanbag and all that, you know, horse shit that he was spinning. I'm like, okay, I get the game that he's playing, right? And as a, as a trader, like, okay, game respect game. If that's a game you're playing and you think you're going to make money doing that, then do what you do. I can't throw shade on you for doing that. Did I think he was, you know, blowing $8 billion and like all sorts of dog shit, like had no accounting, was keeping SSH keys and AWS servers and all sorts of other like this really is crazy shit. shit. I can't believe it. No. <laughs> I mean, like, how is it even possible? Like, uh, I mean, 
like even their insurance fund was fake. Like uh, I don't know. That, that, yeah, that random numbers crazy, It's man. just I mean, <laughs> I've had friends who lost their entire like life savings on this platform, and it's very very sad. And at the other end, it's like this is just so ridiculous. This guy is just so bad. Like he was able to play the game in sort of the the social proof. He played that very very well and was very successful. You know, photo ops with Tom Brady and Giselle and. <laughs> Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and, you know, all these people were like, yeah, Sam, 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 Sam. He had it all locked up, but he's a complete crooked idiot on the other side. So it's it's a sad thing. He could have done some great things with all of the access that he was given if he had not decided to just steal all the money. Do you think we still have but, like very, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, do, do you think we'll still have like kind of big bad guys like him, like or, or bad guys in a way in, in the industry? Uh, that are still very involved in, in the ecosystem, that are maybe managing funds or exchanges, or like, is, what was Sam the, the the baddest motherfucker and, and the worst like uh, guy in the industry? I don't think he was that bad for the industry because, again, what was his damage? Okay, yes, a lot of people lost a lot of money, but did he actually damage the substrate of crypto? No. Like blocks were still produced. Bitcoin worked. Ethereum worked. All these other blockchains worked. There were DeFi protocols that liquidated people. They liquidated Alameda. All this happened in the span of a few days. We had essentially the largest, biggest, one of the biggest exchanges and hedge funds go under in the span of 48 hours, right? And the underlying financial system was sound. Not a thing was out of place. Now, I think that means that we have built something very, very solid. If that had happened in traditional finance, there would have been an emergency central bank meeting every single day on the phone. Okay, let's, let's spend the taxpayers' money bailing out all these other institutions because of the knock-on contagion effects. We didn't have any of that. Everybody who was over leveraged and had too much exposure to the coins at Alameda, Alameda's balance sheet or to Alameda FTX in itself, they all went bust, right? For right or wrong reasons, that happened. We cleaned the system in two days. And then we marched higher from there. Um, you, I think that yeah. the real challenge that we're going to face this cycle is one that's a little bit more um, <clears throat> serious. And that is we're very excited about these funds like BlackRock and Fidelity offering these ETFs. But I don't think people are pr truly appreciating what happens when a Larry Fink, essentially an agent of the you know Pax Americana U.S. financial system, owns a large percentage of the Bitcoin and or the listed mining firms that have equities that they can buy and, and put into a ETF product. What happens if he owns 10, 20, 30% of the yeah. liquid trading supply that they own or these companies? Now, Maybe we're rich, to make but fundamentally... <laughs> yeah. Does, does, he, does he or his senior manager make decisions that are in their best interest as a corporate shareholder and money manager, but are in the worst bad interest of the actual thing that we're trying to build, which is a, a form of money that is outside of state yeah. control. We want privacy. We want decentralization. We want these things. And it's not as if Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these protocols have succeeded. We are constantly experimenting. We need to change things and we need the agreement of the community to change things. If the community is this large asset manager that just wants to create a financial return for people, but keep all the money in essentially a US dollar derivative, then are they going to support the changes that actually make our system stronger? Or are they going to support changes that slowly over time undermine what we are building? And we wake up in you know, 50, 100 years, and what have we accomplished? Nothing. We still have the same monetary system controlled by the same people with the same disastrous results for the 99% of the world population. So I think that is, it's not exactly like Larry Fink's a bad guy. He's just doing what he's supposed to do as a CEO of a firm. But the incentives when you have these large asset managers and what happens in passive investing could prove to be a lot more serious than a Muppet like Sam Bankman Freeze stealing $8 billion of his customers' money. Um, I just wanted to mention that like when we were, we were at the bottom, you were targeting way lower. Um, and, and now we have like big, big guys, just like BlackRock, Fidelity, as you mentioned, that are in the ecosystem. Where are those guys bidding at this moment? And for how much time are they push, positioning themselves um, on the market, in, in your opinion? Well, they don't. I think people misunderstand how an ETF works. BlackRock, Fidelity, they're not buying... Bitcoin in anticipation yeah, of an but they ETF. could also they, they could also in a way they could speculate on that. Why why take that risk? Larry Fink manages I don't know how many trillions of dollars in clips, 10, 20, 30 basis points a year on that. He makes so much money doing nothing. So why would you take <laughs> risk 
free trading. You just wait for the inflows. Okay, great. You want to send me your Bitcoin? I'll charge you 2% management fee. Thank you very much. That's all I have to do. You don't go just out like and a bank trade that. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's just the dumbest thing ever. So to think that these guys are somehow secretly accumulating Bitcoin because the ETF is so going to be bullshit. announced on, on some day. That's bullshit. The, when the ETF is uh, announced, there'll be inflows. Now, people are pre-trading those inflows. Okay, if you think that BlackRock or Fidelity have a great distribution network around the world, and that means so many billions of dollars or other currencies are going to come in wanting to buy Bitcoin in these products, and that's going to provide buying pressure. Okay, I understand that narrative. But it's not that BlackRock or any of these firms themselves are purchasing Bitcoin in anticipation of an ETF being approved and funds flowing into that vehicle. I wanted to get back to, to FTX and I wanted to have kind of your views on the chances, uh, chances of like users getting back the funds. Like, do you think this is something that will happen? Like maybe users getting 100% of the funds uh, or, or maybe a bit less. And what do you think about like FTX tomorrow? Um, what do you think about the uh, a debt token possibly? Is it something that is possible or that is something to, to forget about? So here is my prediction on what's going to happen with FTX. So John Ray, who is the CEO in the bankruptcy proceedings, is going to try to get back as much money as possible and liquidate as many things as he can. And they'll get to a number. I don't know what that number is going to be, but it's going to be less than the eight or 10 or 15 billion, whatever it is that customers and other uh, lenders are owed. So the balance, there's going to be thousands of people around the world who are owed money because the bankruptcy has not been able to claw back enough money to pay them back. So what happens? There's actually a rule in U.S. bankruptcy that if your class of people who are owed money is sufficiently large, you are allowed to list as an equity in the American equity markets, like on the NASDAQ or the, or the NYSE. So my prediction is that sometime in the next 12 to 18 months, FTX is becomes a listed equity in the United States. And if you are owed money from the bankruptcy estate, you'll get a portion of that in cash of some sort. And then a portion of that will be shares in this FTX NUCO. Now, there's various people who are bidding on the right to rebuild FTX and launch it and be listed in the United States. And uh, the, the result of the bidding war will be announced, I think, in the next three months or so. So FTX is going to be a listed equity on the U.S. stock markets that you'll be able to trade, I believe, by 2025. This is kind of interesting because uh, I, I didn't hear like a lot of people like talking about it seriously, I would say, in the, the ecosystem. And I also wanted to, to have kind of your views on FTX 2.0. Are you bullish or are you bearish on it? Like, will like someone trade on it, in your opinion, or is it like... Well, I guess we can separate the... The business in and of itself, and then the stock. So the business, their tech is complete garbage. It's dog shit. The brand, everybody knows what it is, but are you really going to trust that this tech that was so poorly built? Dog shit. Dog shit. It's terrible. <laughs> there's backdoors. There's all sorts of things. Whatever Sam and Gary were up to building while they were on uh, on amphetamines, that's what it is. Right? So would you trust your assets there good. again? That's why I, I was kind of surprised that you mentioned that. I mean, there are well, some backdoors, but we're finding this out all now. We're, we're finding all these things out now when we find out that they didn't actually build any of these things. They were just taking risk and had massive losses because they didn't actually build the tech the way it was supposed to be built. They, it, they built something fast. It wasn't good. When they lost money, they just took it from customers. That's what we're finding out. So, would you put your money back on this exchange, even if somebody new was running it? Question mark. However, the stock I think will do amazing. Because what you'll have is you'll have a derivatives exchange with all international customers listed in America where the American exchanges can't actually provide perps or any of these other products, right? So it's the best of both worlds. You get the liquid capital markets of America, all the degen traders who are in Asia and in Eurasia, right? And so I think the stock will fucking pump. So if you're able to get your hands on some of that stock, it'll do very well. The underlying business, don't give a fuck. It's a zero over time. After the, the fall of FTX, uh, personally, I thought that DeFi would get more traction, but it will be more adopted in a way, even like within the industry. Um, but this is not something I personally noticed. Um, I, I was kind of disappointed of like um, how the decentralized exchanges and solutions were kind of uh, used uh, after the, the fall of FTX. 
Um, how do you see it change? Like, do you think it will change one day? Because like we had one of the largest, not the largest, one of the largest um, der derivatives exchange, like uh, com go completely uh, bankrupt. And even after that, like the, the this kind of decentralized product still didn't get really adopted like uh, in a, in the very quick way. So, do you think it will change like within the next month? For like um, decentralized trading, for example, is not something that will take off uh, one day. I mean, I think it's already taking off. If you take a look at the volumes on DYDX and GMX, they're doing you know close to a billion dollars a day combined. Uh, on every day trading one. Oh, okay. No, it's obviously kind of that's stagnating much less than, in a way. This is what I, I, I was mentioning. Anyway. Uh, yeah, but it's, the thing is that it's hard to use. These are not as the platforms are not as easy to use as a centralized exchange. It's a different type of client base. You really have to want to use these things, right? And so my prediction is that as you know, the centralized exchange base matures, they're going to look a lot of, a lot like the traditional derivatives exchanges that we're all familiar with. You know, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Eurex. You know, all the different ones, right? Very, very boring, no innovation things, right? Which works for a particular type of client. If you're a large institutional trader, cool, you've got you know, super high latency, blah, 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 right? But if you actually care about the new things, the new way of doing things, the new cryptocurrencies, all that energy, like the energy of people who are building new things, it's in the DeFi space. Now, maybe they haven't hit the right product market fit yet, but I fucking am tired of seeing perp decks this, perp decks that. I get in there my inbox every fucking day. Now, I'm a bit annoyed because I have to look at these things. Well, not me, but the people who work for me are looking at these decks all day. And, you know, they're all me too pieces of shit. But it just shows that there's energy in this space. People are trying to, how do, can I make the best possible trading experience on DeFi for derivatives? Because I know that in the future, true cryptocurrency traders are not going to be trading on centralized exchanges. That doesn't mean... Sexes aren't that good businesses. They're great businesses, and they'll continue to be great businesses as we adopt different types of people into the ecosystem who want to trade in a different type, different way. But if you want to talk about where's the innovation going to happen, where are we going to create the new perpetual swap? It's not going to be in a centralized crypto exchange. It's going to be some new DeFi primitive that discovers a new way or new product that addresses a certain type of risk that's new in crypto. So I would expect a liquid staking derivatives market. That's going to be huge. We're already seeing lots of energy and like. We have this yield. We have this ETH staking yield, you know, the number one risk, you know, yielding asset that's native to a protocol. It's, it's commodity. How do we leverage that? How do we trade it? How do we hedge it? There's people just focusing on these things. And I think this market is where we're going to find the next perpetual swap is going to be somebody building something in the liquid staking derivatives market. Personally, I've been trading on DYDX like for a year. Um, they mostly... Uh, they, they sponsor most of my shows. So uh, personally, I really do like those kind of solutions. Among the solutions that are available, I, I've seen that you you bet it like a lot uh, in a way on GMX. Um, why GMX, for example? Like, wh why do you believe on on, on GMX and and maybe some of the of the other bags that you you hold on your end? So I mean, order books are very difficult to do on DeFi. It's very resource intensive. I know that a lot of projects, teams, you know, DYDX included, are focused on building a very low latency order book exchange that is on chain. I believe that that is a CFI thing, so a centralized thing. If we want to do it in the DeFi space, then we just want to want to remove order books because they're confusing for people. People like just clicking a button, buying and selling. So when I saw GMX. And I saw that it was basically like a swap model where there was a bank and you bet against the bank as a trader, but it was very seamless in, uh, uh, UI. The volumes that they were doing in 2022 during the depths of the bear market, these guys were doing, you know, 100, 200, 300 million dollar a days when I mean, nobody was trading. I was like, wow, this is the future. This is amazing. I need to own a part of this. And that's why I aped into the GMX. And I think I'm one of the largest holders of the thing. <laughs> so I think that they're really they're really on to a, a DeFi native way of trading. And that's what I want to see, because if we're just going to take the things that work on a centralized exchange and try to ram them on on chain, it's not going to work because it's different. The trading experience is different. The constraints are different. So can we create a super low latency order book exchange? Maybe. I guess DYDX is trending a lot of other platforms and they're moving to different uh, layer ones to try to make that happen. But I don't think that's true DeFi. Understood. Um, I was just wondering, like, how do you view, like, um, 
such narr- so, some narratives like real world assets. Um, we, I think personally, I, I expect it to, to be quite big during the next cycle and to be quite big, like in the DeFi uh, ecosystem. Uh, do you think that in a way it's true DeFi? Because at the end of the day, you have central point of failure. And um, yeah, how do you see it like play out in, uh, in the next cycle? Do you see it as something big, as maybe Larry Finks mentions it? Or like, uh, is it something that uh, is very hype and not very adapted uh, in your way? So I think, so when I think of real world assets, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not super in the weeds on this. I'm thinking of U.S. Treasuries yield 5%. Most people can't own treasuries. I'm going to create a centralized company that's going to buy some treasuries and then have a receipt. I'm going to put this receipt on chain and you're going to trade this, this token that represents an ownership of a yeah. treasury that I have collateralized. Is that, that's what real world assets means to you? Um, I mean, real world assets to me is like everything from the real world that is tokenized. So it could be in a way treasure, treasury bills, but it also, it could also be, uh, I don't know, watches. It could be apartments. It could be houses. It could be like also physical things, uh, physical items in a way. Yeah. So I think that real world assets are one of those things that sound great to uh, venture capital funds, but don't actually make any real sense at the end of the day. Because number one is like, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to bring liquidity to things that are in the real world, but on the internet, right? And so do I want to own a singular apartment building? How am I going to create liquidity on that? Or a watch, you know, there's, you know, I'm going to go on a fractional watch. Okay, that's cool. You buy one of these things, you can't get out of it. How do you find liquidity on this fractional watch uh, that you that you own? So you're basically just sticking your money in something and you'll never get it back. So I think real world assets sound great because, it's, oh yeah, okay, we have, I don't know, however many hundreds of trillions of dollars of real world stuff. If we just took 2% of that and we put it on crypto and we charged the 1% fee, oh my God, we're going to be rich. And that's the pitch deck, right? And, but they're not, no one's going to trade this shit. People are going to buy it once, like, okay, yeah, real world assets, I can own a piece of apartment. And then they have an issue where they need to get some of their money back. And it's like, okay, well, I need to sell this thing. And someone's like, well, I don't want that piece of apartment. I like this apartment over here. So like, there's no standardization because the assets are different. I now need to trust this centralized entity issuing a real world asset. I mean, there's going to be some real world asset mega scams. Some really good promoter is going to get on stage and tell you about how he or she has been able to accumulate all these things. They've got this like super funky legal structure or they, you know, that you own a piece of this SPV and the BVI and the Cayman <laughs> Islands. And then you're like, oh yeah, that sounds real great. And then you put your yeah. money in and then boom, it comes out that they haven't done shit, right? Because yeah. you're trusting this opaque legal system in a highly transparent cryptocurrency situation. So I think it sounds great. It's a great thing that people are going to li- a pindu because the total addressable market in theory is very large, but fundamentally it doesn't make any fucking sense. Like if I want to go buy, so you're very skeptical. <laughs> go buy an apartment. And the, um, I mean, the number yeah. one the RWA like play is like I'm going to give some treasuries to people who don't own treasuries. Okay, that makes sense. But why not just go long some swaptions? Because at the end of the day, all of this is an interest rate play. If the Fed drops rates to zero. That, that RWA play on treasuries is worth zero because I'm earning no yield. So I'm just going to go back to Ave and Compound. At least I can make 2 or 3% of my ETH, right? So if you want to earn in these these plays, instead of paying these guys a multiple on like Fugazi revenue, just buy some fucking leverage trades on TLT. Like there's no point. Why, why give these people money? I don't get it. I, I think the main issue here, uh, I, I don't know if you get it in a way, is that first, like... Um, like houses, apartments are they get, getting very expensive for, I would say, the average consumer, the average retail investor. And so this is a way for them to kind of expose themselves and, and get yeah, some exposure to these kind of investments. And also the thing is that whenever you are like in the crypto industry, like a lot of people in the industry are like all in on the ecosystem. They are DGEN, they are like fully um, collateralized in, the, in crypto. They only own crypto some of the time. And sometimes maybe when a bear market starts, you want to get some exposure on other kind of products to kind of diversify yourself and not concentrate all your risks on the one type of assets. So I think this is where like uh, uh, real world assets comes in and, and makes sense in a way. Do you agree with that or 
This no, I think no that for you. What, you're desc- what you're describing is an exchange traded fund. We invented these this in the 90s, right? You want to own a piece of an apartment building? There's a BlackRock fund. They know how to fucking underwrite a building. You can go buy one. It has an exposure to different buildings across the United States or Europe or Asia, or wherever, right? You can go buy one of these ETFs. Why would you? Why would you go and trust some Muppet who probably hasn't like ever traded anything? <laughs> <laughs> default yeah. and try to fight and say, okay, I'm going to create these funky legal structures and then I'm going to put it on chain and I'm going to pitch that I'm going to have all this liquidity. But like, why as a market maker would I make a market on a slice of an apartment? So yes, I have an exposure to this apartment, but at the end of the day, when you come to sell it, no one's there to buy it. So what do you have? You have nothing. Yes, you have a pretty number on a screen that says I have so much money, but if you ever need it, you don't have it. So that's the problem with these things is they sound great in theory, but at the end of the day, who's going to provide the liquidity when you want to exit this trade? Because what you have is a very idiosyncratic asset and you have to think about legal structures. If you own property, okay, where is it located? What are the rules? Okay, like, you know, people pitch me like farmland. Okay, yeah, well, I own a piece of farmland. How do I fucking sell that? Who's going to buy it from me? Oh, I'm going to go visit the goddamn farm and like look at the yield on fucking corn? Fuck that shit. It's no one's ever <laughs> going to give you liquidity on these things on the way out. And so that's the problem with RWA. But it sounds great because you think about every asset in the world can be tokenized. And therefore, if I only get a small percentage, my business makes money. And that's a great pitch to a VC. And the VCs love it because who can fault that logic? Yeah, I can see that liquidity is kind of your issue here. Uh, I think this is mostly big guy problems because whenever you like, you get big size, like liquidity matters. So whenever you want something to be adopted, you want also like some big guys in town to adopt this thing. And if you have no liquidity, they will not, they will never get in in a way. So, um, I just wanted to have your views on the other narratives that are like, um, um, on the market and that you, you kind of like monitor uh, on your side. Uh, we mentioned real world assets. That is not something you're interested in. Um, are you looking at, I don't know, AI stuff, um, decentralized trading stuff? Uh, what are the main top- topics that comes to your mind? Maybe, I don't know, gaming. What, what are the main topics that comes to your mind whenever you think about investing for the next cycle? In a digital way, because I, I would say that most of the time you are exposed to um, Bitcoin and ETH, but whenever you want to make maybe uh, risk your best w- bets, what are the narratives you're, you're playing with? Cette vidéo vous est présentée en partenariat avec DYDX. DYDX est la solution décentralisée qui vous permet de trader les principales crypto-monnaies de manière liquide sur mobile et ordinateur. Contrairement à la majorité des exchanges, vous n'avez pas besoin de vous kawaii ici et vous récupérez la majorité des frais que vous payez. Plus de 60 000 personnes utilisent déjà DYDX et j'en fais partie, alors qu'attendez-vous Scannez le QR code sur votre écran ou utilisez le lien dans la description pour créer votre compte avec un simple wallet et profitez de 5% de réduction sur vos frais. Allez, on repart sur l'interview. AI is definitely the number one narrative out there. AI is going to change the world. We're, humans are very um, good at forecasting things in the short run that are over-optimistic, but underappreciating the long end. So in the long term, I think AI will completely change what it means to be a human. The long term could be 10 years, could be 20 years, could be 30 years, right? But if we're talking about the next two-year cycle, is the entire global economy or some 40% of it or whatever the, the, high, the number is going to all of a sudden start using AI in a way that makes people actual money, that companies providing these things? Absolutely not. We're going to forecast this amazing future, discount it back to today, and then pay crazy prices for stuff. So yeah, I want to participate in that. So I want, but I want to do it in a way where I can sell when I believe that the air is coming out of the narrative and the liquidity is draining. So what does that mean? I don't want to invest in an AI company starting today that's going to go public in seven years. The market is not going to be there for them. I don't want to invest in a, a token project that's going to go TGE in 2026. I don't, I'm locked up for another two years. I don't get my money until 2028. No, I don't want that shit either. I want existing things that are already live that I can purchase on a liquid trading venue that have an AI story or it could create an AI story because I might pay a high multiple for their earnings or sales or whatever it is, but I know I can get out of that, that stock, that token, that whatever, right? So I want things listed today. So if I had to only trade in TradFi, then I'd be going along, you know, Amazon and NVIDIA or some other, you know, combination of chip stocks and sort of cloud compute. If I'm in the crypto uh, situation and I've given a whole essay about this and uh, a pitch on stage, Filecoin, decentralized storage, AIs need storage. I believe that Filecoin could touch that narrative and retake its all-time high in, in this cycle. 
on, you know, AIs are going to have to trade and have to fundraise decentralized exchanges. I mean, we all know that decentralized exchanges are great for humans, but even better for AIs who don't want to deal with the analog financial system because it doesn't make sense to them intuitively. So I love DEXs and I want to participate in the top DEXs, whether that's on a, a spot trading basis or, or on a derivatives basis. So those are the types of things I'm looking for. But again, I want things that are liquid today. The early stage stuff that we're doing in Maelstrom, we're more focused more on infrastructure things that are related around staking. That's probably the most number of projects where we've done there around uh, ETH staking and restaking, because that's going to be something that's going to be here in 2030, 2035, when we're able to actually sell any of this stuff. But if I'm thinking about my liquid trading portfolio, DGEN portfolio, okay, fine. I'm not going to get in on the, the pre-sale deal. I'll buy it once it's up 5,000%. I don't care. But if it can go up another 100x from there, great. Do I think it's going to last to 2030? Probably not. So I'm going into it knowing that I'm investing in a piece of shit. But I believe, and maybe this is my hubris speaking, that if I can have a very concrete view on the cycle and liquidity, that sort of I can hopefully time the time when the narrative shifts and say, okay, well, you know, people are starting to question, am I overpaying for AI? Is Are the results living up to what I thought the hype would be a year or two years from now? When people start asking themselves those questions. Then I know it's time to start exiting the market because then, you know, the VCs start asking, so, well, okay, well, where's your revenue? Like, how do you, what's your path to revenue? Like, VCs don't ask those questions in the mobile market. They just say, yeah, spend my money, you know, get users. I don't care if you make money. And then, you know, 2022 comes around where the Fed raises rates from zero to 5%. It's like, show me a path to profitability, please. And it says, well, what the fuck? I thought that I could just show up with a PowerPoint and get $10 million in a Series A. Like, nah, son, that was a 0% world. This is a 5% world now. Show me that fucking money, <laughs> right? So when we start to get to that situation, then I hopefully have exited by that point. Yeah, I, I've heard that you've been concerned for a while now about the timing. I think this is like the, the biggest concern for you, in being able to get out at the right time. But, but Because like whenever, whenever it, it gets, I would say, hard, uh, especially on the, the traditional markets. Um, I think you, you're you not um, very bullish on the uh, economy. So um, why are you so bearish on the economy? Uh, I've heard that you've been very bearish on, um, I would say, the, the debt from the governments, um, the inflation rates, um, how the, the money and the currencies are, are managed. Um, is there anything that we are missing that you never spoke about before? So I think at, at a high level, everywhere around the world has the same problem, at least in the developed world. There are not enough people having kids. They made a lot of promises to people. And now it's really expensive to keep those promises, whether it's defense spending, it's healthcare spending, um, it's keeping energy costs at a particular level, given the current geopolitical stand situation. So politicians around the world were said, just make it easy for people. They sold them a lot of bullshit. And now... The bill is coming due. And so what's the option? Either it's reset the system and reset people's expectations saying, hey, you know what? I know your parents had a great life and, you know, lived this amazing, but, you know, it's time for austerity. We need to pay down the debt. No, that's not happening. You don't get, you don't get reelected. You don't get support, whether you're an elected president or an autocrat, if that's your message. It's, I'm going to go out there and in spite of everything that's going on, you're going to be okay. Please support me. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means we're going to print money because that's the only thing that governments know how to do when they're pushed against the corner. And so while, you know, the different growth rates will vary around the world, the government is going to spend money because they want to stay the, the situation that we have this fiat Keynesian post-World War II system that everybody is a part of that is trying to stay relevant against the forces of not enough people, too much debt, and um, the productivity of, you know, mass adoption of hydrocarbons is coming to, you know, marginal decline. And so it's just harder to keep the, the wheel going. And so they can squeeze money printing. And so assets like Bitcoin and crypto um, do very well in this environment when we're at the changing point of what we think of as the global economy and how it should be managed. And this isn't, you know, a capitalist, communist, socialist thing. It's an everybody thing because we all kind of buy into the same system and just put some bells around the edges to you know, sell whatever vision you want to sell to your domestic populace. I'm 100% aligned with your vision. Um, but something that concerns me is that uh, it makes probably the next cycle be a, a bit different. You mentioned that you were like extremely bullish for the, the upcoming years. Um, and 
this cycle, we had someone called Suzu who told us that we were like in a super cycle. Uh, and <laughs> this is a bit what you mentioned in a way, like that this cycle will be different from the other ones. Um, is this time really different? Like, do you see it really change th th this time, this cycle? Or like, uh, will it be like all the other ones? And at the end of the day, at the end of the cycle, um, we'll just repeat it and the economy will be fine. So I think that Suzu what was kind of right. He's got he just one cycle off. Uh, so <laughs> now... It was too early. Too early. And then too early is the same as being wrong. And so the problem is that we have all this debt. And so now it's everyone is questioning whether the governments can safeguard their government bond markets. And obviously they can't. They can't make good on all these promises given the situation that we're in. And so we're going to have an amazing run up in the next two to three years, right? And, you know, I'm thinking about, I need to make as much money as I can in this bull market because, you know, unfortunately, a very probable outcome is some sort of massive global war. And you, it's unpredictable what happens in a war. You know, you, you could be, you know, dead, you, know, you could be bankrupted, whatever. But, um, and so you want to basically make sure that you have enough fi financial firepower to do what you need to do to make sure you're safe for you and your family, regardless of what happens. And so, if the governments are going to inflate away and, and attempt to do the thing that every other government in history has tried to do and always failed, which is print money to solve domestic problems, I want to make sure that I own assets that are going to do very, very well in that situation so that when the hard times come, I have savings to do whatever I need to do to stay safe and be able to live a life that I, I want to live. So I think we're coming to the end of the post-World War II system, this Keynesian system. I don't know what the next system is going to be, but it's not going to be like the, the one prior. And Bitcoin is a net beneficiary of the volatility of change. And these fiat financial systems, which are volatility suppressants, are inherently unnatural. The universe wants to become more chaotic, not less. And so when you try to push it in the bottle for 80 years, it fucking explodes in your face. And that explosion, I think, comes at the end of the decade. And so, again, I just want to be ready uh, and, you know, very sour mood as we end this. But I guess that's kind of that's kind of how I'm conceptualizing it. And I do think this is going to be a very massive cycle. We're going to take crypto from a one, two trillion asset. It could be 10, 20 trillion, whatever it is. It's going to be bigger than anyone thought it was going to be. But also it's going to crash as well versus whatever we think is the global source of energy because it's going to be overhyped at some point. So basically your focus is on uh, preparing the next cycle and making sure that you make like a sh shit on, uh, a sh ton of money and you don't have to, to look back uh, and, and um, prepare yourself also for what the economy could, um, I would say, take um, with like all those risks in sound, right? Basically. Um, I think we covered like a lot of topics. Um, just maybe to finish this interview, I wanted to um yeah um know what makes you happy in your in life like uh, except making money like what what makes you happy and and happy to 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 live your life uh i love skiing so i i spend three months of the year skiing i love kite surfing uh i love i guess spent a week sports. surfing which was sports uh being outside being in nature experiencing this amazing planet that we have uh, you know, hanging out with my friends, having a good bottle of wine, having eating good food, right? That's what's enjoyable about life. Money is just, it's just a thing to buy these things, to be able to have your time to do with, what it, if you wish to read a book, if you want to on a, you know, a Tuesday afternoon, just because you're interested in a particular topic, to go to a nice concert, to, you know, see your favorite artist, right? That's what I like doing. The making money thing is just a means to an end, the means to having my time to do whatever, whatever I like to do with my time. So that's what makes me happy. The money, I don't really, it's whatever. It's just an abstraction of energy. And like um, you mentioned that before, uh, that you don't see yourself manage um, like people in the future, or at least like not like at uh, Bitmex. Do you see yourself like creating like new companies and and do uh, more similar things to what you've done in the past? Or are you done with this shit? And are you like more like um, in a mood of like skiing and partying like all year long? Um, <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather be on a ski I'd rather be on a ski slope than in a boardroom trying to manage twelve egos. I'll invest in other people who are at a different stage of their lives where that's what they need to do to make it, and thankfully have the capital to do so. But I am done with that life, and that's not for me. Okay, thank you very much for this interview. Maybe do you have any 
Uh, last words for the last words, last, last thoughts uh, for the French speaking community, maybe some things that they will keep in their mind. Um, remember from you, from this interview for uh, the future in the industry and, and for the next cycle. Uh, don't trust, verify. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Archer. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.